Welcome back to Raised by Giants, where we talk all things spirituality. I'm Ryder Lee. Tonight, I'm very excited for our guest. We have retired Sergeant First Class of the United States Army, remote viewer Lynn Buchanan. But before I introduce him, check out Raised by Giants on Rockfin. It is a completely uncensored platform. Go over there, set up a free account, get all of my regular content that I post here on YouTube, and sign up for Rockfin's premium content, which is far less than a YouTube premium account at only $10 a month. And you'll get all of my premium uncensored content when it gets released and all of the other creators premium content as well, like Beyond Classified, Charlie Robinson, Jay Dyer, Zero with Sam Tripoli, Tinfoil Hat, Eddie Bravo, and Rex Bear Leak Project, and much more. Check the link in the description to sign up for the video streaming platform, Rockfin. Also, check out C60 Purple Power. It is the most powerful antioxidant on the planet. Helps with energy levels, skin problems, infections, eyesight, brain cognition, EMF radiation, and a lot more. It's a free radical sponge that gives your body the ability to heal itself. And if you use promo code GIANTS10 from the link in the description, you'll get 10% off your entire purchase. Highly recommend it. Been using it for over a year with now with my own money. And I wouldn't recommend something that doesn't work. So without further ado, introducing tonight's guest, Lynn Buchanan. Lynn is the author of several books, including The Seventh Sense. He is a retired sergeant first class who served in the United States Army and a founding member of the International Remote Viewing Association. As a remote viewer, he served as a trainer in the United States Army Remote Viewing Unit from 1984 to 1992, and is currently serves on the board of directors of IRVA. Lynn is also a database manager, a property book officer, and executive director of Problems, Solutions, and Innovations a controlled remote viewing training enterprise based in New Mexico. Hello and welcome to the show, Lynn. It's an honor and a privilege you taking the time to speak with me this evening. How are you doing? Oh, fine. It's an honor to be invited to it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm very excited to have you on. I've uh, and have this great discussion that we're going to have. And I've been going deep on the government remote viewing programs and the MK Ultra programs as well, because I think that there's a connection there that a lot of people are really looking over. But we'll get into that a little bit later. Now, you were involved with the Army Intelligence Program and the DIA's remote viewing Stargate. Uh, program, though that wasn't the original name of it. It was uh, changed through uh, multiple iterations. When I think when someone figured out about the project, they just ended up switching the name of it and then just telling everybody, hey, uh, we're now, this is a different program now. They just changed the title. Oh, no, they would they would say, oh, that program's been discontinued. We don't do that anymore. Yeah. And they'd hand us new stamps and say, you're in this new project now. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a way for them just to, uh, you know, keep, keep going along with the exact same project just by renaming it and being like, Hey, this is what we're doing now. But um, you were in this remote viewing program from 1984 to 1992. So take us back to before 1984. How did you get involved with this project from the very beginning, from the very start? And also, I don't want to make this a two-parter question. I'm sure that's a, a big enough story in itself. But when did you start first remote viewing? How did you uh, discover this ability that you had? Well, I didn't start remote viewing until I was in the military unit. Um, now, I've had um, intuitive abilities all my life, and uh, one of them has been what's called PK, uh, psychokinesis, especially around the electronic stuff. And uh, anyway, I was in the, uh, I was stationed at the, uh, U.S. Uh, Department of Defense um, listening post, basically, in Augsburg, Germany. And uh, there was a, there were 12 countries there who were in that same facility. 
and they needed a program which would tie the computers of all 12 countries together. Uh, I got chosen to write that program. There was another sergeant who wanted the job, but I got chosen over him. He was really very angry about that, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, one day the uh, program was finished. I was to give the song and dance to the commanding generals of all 12 countries. And we met in the uh, in a conference room right before it was time for me to uh, start the meeting. Uh, I went to the restroom to make sure my hair was in place and there were no wrinkles in my uniform and all that. And I came back and I started my song and dance and introduced and, you know, told what was happening. And then I went to demonstrate the program. I turned around and hit the enter key and the program went dead. And, uh, of course, everybody started laughing at me. And uh, I looked back up, and the other sergeant was at the back door, and he mouthed, gotcha, and turned around and walked off. I got flaming, flaming angry. And all of my life, if I get really, really angry, bad things happen <laughs> because of that PK ability. Uh, and sure enough, the entire field station went down. Uh, all the computers in the entire field station suddenly went down. Uh, I knew what had happened, but uh, I was about to admit it. You know, I could I could see my great grandchildren still paying for computers, and uh, General Stubblebine, the head of the Intelligence and Security Command, had a uh, young captain there who had been instructed to look for these psychic events. And he spotted that and he reported me to General Stubblebine. A few months later, General Stubblebine came out to install a new commander at the field station. And uh, when he did, they called me into the new commander's office and General Stubblebine said, you know, got right up in my face with a scowl. Did you kill my computers with your mind? And I intended to lie about it. <laughs> and I just sort of heard myself say, yes, sir, I did. And he said, far effing out if I ever got a job for you. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he took me to Washington, D.C., in order to start a unit where we would kill enemy computers with the end result of uh, trying to learn how to control the enemy computers with our minds so that we could make their missiles turn around and go back and I'm going to drop into the sea or whatever. Or we could reprogram the enemy computers with our minds. And um, Congress said no. Absolutely not. We will not fund that. So General Stolbein had already taken me out of Augsburg. He had nothing really to do with me. And so he took me out to this unit at Fort Meade, Maryland. And he said, these are remote viewers, which I'd never heard of. And uh, he said, uh, we're going to put you in this unit. And I think you'll do well here. And he left. <laughs> so they read me on. And reading you on is where they give you a sheet of paper that tells what the remote, what the unit really does instead of what they tell the public they do. And uh, this is with all classified units. So they have this paper. They read you on. And down at the bottom, it says, if you, you know, uh, relay any of this information to anyone, it's 10 years in jail and a uh, $10,000 fine. And so you don't do it. And uh, so I was reading this paper and, and I thought, this is stupid. 
the military doesn't do psychic work. And over the next couple of weeks, I watched the other guys in the unit and they were doing it. And it was amazingly accurate stuff. And and I was just fascinated by the whole thing. And uh, so they taught me the controlled remote viewing and I became part of the unit. And um, I became the uh, database manager working the computers and also one of the controlled remote viewers. And within about three years, I became the unit trainer and uh, spent the rest of my time there in the unit training and viewing. And, uh, and How many people were in this unit whenever you got there, Lynn? Because from my understanding, it was like from 10 to 15 people. Was there no. less than that? In the entire time of the unit, I think there were 18 people. Now, when I got there, there were uh, five other people. So the project started around when did when exactly did the uh, this we're just calling a Stargate project because that's what it's known as now, but I think that it started around 1965. Is that correct? Where, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So and it's and, in, and it's an entirety from up until 1995, whenever it uh, closed down and they they shut it down. There was only 18 people there in, in, a, in a hole from the time that it started, from the time that it ended? That I know of, yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. Wow. And this was at a in an old military barracks, right? There's no uh, <laughs> coastal, yeah. Uh, and it was, uh, I mean, Splinter Village. I tell you, it was, it was uh, early World War II. Uh, building, wooden building, uh, no, no insulation. I mean, no insulation, no cooling, and uh, luckily we had heating for the winter. But during the summer, we would bring fans and keep the windows open, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned earlier that you were right into the program now the program has been uh completely declassified now so i'm pretty sure that you can mention exactly what was on that paper what what was the official mission of this unit what what was the the statement that they gave the people that were in the unit that you were actually going to be involved with i won't tell what's on the paper but uh the main thing that we did was uh, collect intelligence information against enemy uh, and possible enemy uh, situations. Uh, we were absolutely forbidden to collect intelligence against U.S. citizens or U.S. Uh, installations or anything unless it was uh, for national defense, and then it had to be approved by Congress for us to even do that. And so we didn't do U.S. targets. We did foreign targets. Not even in the, the training process, because I'm under the impression that the, the training process lasts for like a year before that they can really trust you in order uh, to give you an actual like intelligence target. Yeah. So what was what... that before I got there? Um, it had been shortening. At one time it was two years of training before they would work and then a year. And then by the time I got there, uh, I was fully operational in a little bit over six months. Uh, so they had been learning how to teach it better. Ingo Swan, who had created this, had been improving it. And uh, there's a thing called the hundredth monkey effect. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Yeah. Uh, the more people learn something, the easier it is to learn. And uh, so, yeah, it took me a little over six months and I was operational. 
And who who was it that trained you? Was it was it Ego Swan? Because I know that he had a hand in training a lot of the the unit yeah. members in uh, in the unit. He lost his contract with SRI the week before I got there. <laughs> it's the story of my life, and uh, uh, so I trained with the people who had been trained by Ingo Swan. Yeah. Also, he was no longer there whenever you got into the unit? It, it wasn't, but uh, I got to know Ingo, and uh, I would go up and visit. Yeah, and so uh, I, I got a lot from Ingo that was not official training, yeah. Yeah, that's really, uh, that's really interesting. Uh, so that would have been when you when you first got in 1984. So he was already out of the, the program in 1984. So that only he'd only been in there, what, nine, nine years, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, I think Pat Price left around that same time as well, around 1984, well. too. Like the director of intelligence said one time, Pat Price died and we haven't seen him since. Uh, his death was highly sus suspicious and uh, basically nobody was ever found. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's 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 a really suspicious one, and they, there was a lot of things that that happened. With his death, there, uh, his family was informed after the body had already been cremated. There was no autopsy, no body recognition. Uh, so it was, it, there was a lot of hokey uh, things going on there. So, as, as I have heard, there was no body found or autopsied or cremated or anything. I think that was just added for the family. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. Very, very, very strange circumstances uh, surrounding yeah. his death. But um, you just mentioned that you didn't, they didn't have any, they didn't, they couldn't allow you to, you know, spy or, or look at other operations in the U.S. like, uh, you know, spying on political leaders or other agencies yeah. or other aspects of the military or government but not, not unless it was for uh provable defense reasons uh one time a uh, drug agent went rogue and we were tasked to find him and uh that was really one of the very few u.s citizens that i can remember that we were tasked to spy on <laughs> excuse me yeah, it's really interesting too because um, David David Morehouse. Uh, are you familiar with who he is? Oh yeah, Dave's good friend. Yeah, uh, he states that the the DIA or the military would come in every once in a while and, and do an audit and destroy yeah. the notes and the details about some of the remote viewing targets. Is no, true or not? Uh, no. They would come in and do an audit and go through the records to check them and all that. We had a director who had evidently, without our knowing, had tasked us against a U.S. citizen. He got word that they were coming to go through and audit the records. He couldn't find the stuff for that session. And so I went in one morning and uh, he was there shredding everything he could find, all of our records and all that, just just to get rid of that one record. And uh, so I called up to DIA and asked them to call to speak to him. When they called, he told me to go ahead and uh, and shred records, which was our history. And uh, so I'm not proud of this, never have had to pay for it. I just stuck a screwdriver down into the shredder and broke it. And uh, and no, that's, that's where the shredding of the documents came from. It was not the uh, 
inspector general that did it. It was this one director that we had. Yeah. Yeah, trying to cover uh, cover his tracks up, and he couldn't find the actual document that he was looking for, so he just decided to shred them all, or start I shredding them all. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, also, according to Angela Ford, um, which uh, you're aware of her, that's how I got in contact with you. Uh, you you know her. I had her on my show. She's a wonderful, wonderful lady. She, she's a good viewer too. She she's she's a an extremely good natural psychic. She's very good. And according to her, the, the, the CIA was supposed to take over the uh, Stargate project in 95, but instead they, they shut it down and basically said it was a failure and never produced any kind of conclusive data. So I might be jumping ahead here a little bit. I do want to get back to some other things, but are you aware of any other remote viewing projects that the the CIA might have been doing either before or after the DIA Stargate project? I was retired at that time, and when you retire, they quit telling you secrets. Yeah. Um, I'm not officially aware of any, no. Yeah, I was just curious because there's rumors that the that the Navy and the Air Force had their own uh, SAP uh, on remote viewing and uh, psychics, but it's not proven, of course. Uh, and the only reason that I asked about the the CIA is because reading through some of the declassified MK Ultra documents, it seemed that the the CIA and Sidney Gottlieb was really interested in ESP and and SI research and subproject 83 and subproject 136. And there's a few others that I can't think of right off the top of my head, but there's a total of around four or five projects uh, that, you know, the subprojects of MKUltra that's been declassified that they were studying uh, ESP, SI abilities and remote viewing. So, in my eyes, it's like highly likely that later on, possibly that the CIA did in fact create their own remote viewing or sci research program. So I think the government would be stupid not to. Hmm. That changes the question to does our government ever do anything stupid? So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it just strikes me interesting that they that they were definitely interested in it. I mean, uh, if you read the, through those documents, it's uh, plainly stated that they were researching on uh, ESP and some kind of um, yeah. And back in uh, back in Vietnam, the Marines had a program, you know, for uh, dowsing to find uh, the tunnels and. Uh, Things like that. Yeah, this has always been a um, an interest. And it's always been an interest because it works. Uh, you know, our, our um, accuracy rate was extremely high. And uh, uh, higher, in fact, than most of the other intelligence efforts. Um, this stuff works. <laughs> what can I say? It works. Can you talk about uh, some of the intelligence targets uh, that, that wasn't a part of the the practice uh, or the training that you went through? Some of the actual targets that they had you remote viewing in the program? I think I can now that it's been pretty well, for the most part, declassified. Not completely, but for the most part. Uh, yeah, we did uh, foreign leaders, uh, plans and intentions on the next day of battle of military leaders. Um, <clears throat> we did uh, fruit movements. Uh, we did um, uh, scientific and research developments in foreign countries. You know, what were their new weapons? What were their new developments and uh, uh, not only not only in warfare but also other stuff 
but uh, also uh, not just operational, but strategic things. What were the what were the political people? Uh, what was what was their bent mentally? Uh, would they go along with the party, or would they? Were they able to be swayed away from the party? And uh, you know, we collected intelligence on uh, on people, places, things. Uh, we would find the uh, uh, facilities and actually draw maps of the facilities. Uh, we would uh, in hostage crises. Um, I know you know of Joe McMonagall. Yes. Uh, this was the best one I've seen of the work of all the ones that we did. Um, he drew the floor plans of the building where the hostage was being held, told them where the building was, and uh, with those floor plans, they were going. They were able to go in and rescue the general that had been captured without getting him killed. And uh, we had we had lots of things where uh, research facilities. We would actually draw the floor plans and uh, and draw the things that were being researched and developed there. Wow, that's incredible. Um, now, what kind of feedback were you getting during this time? Because from my understanding and talking with some others from this program, seems like that you guys weren't getting too much feedback on your targets. It was kind of like, hey, this is what I see. This is what I got. And then they put the data and then they take the data and put take it someplace else or give it to someone else. Yeah. And you don't really we, get any feedback. We didn't get nearly enough feedback. Uh, and this, of course, was one of the uses for the database and for the practice sessions. We would do practice sessions and keep data on the practice sessions. And that way we had a track record so that uh, when we turned in information, we at least had a track record that would, you know, that would say, hey, we're this accurate. And, uh, you know, track record within a, within a scope of so many points where this accurate, you can depend on our, on our information to this degree. And of course our information was put, always put into a pool with spy in the sky satellites, ground agents, uh, electronic information, uh, human information and, and so on. And so it was mixed in and, uh, and was used quite often. Do you think that maybe that was kind of like a, a way of like not telling you guys of how good you are and the success rate of the remote viewing was kind of a way to be like, hey, we're shutting this program. I know you were out, you were retired before it actually officially shut down. But do you think that that was kind of like a process of them, you know, we're not going to let them know how good they are and how much success that they've actually had. So whenever we go to shut it down, there won't be really any complaints and everyone will just kind of accept it. That was a small part of it. Uh, most of it was just the legal aspect of classification. I know uh, several times I would turn in information and they would come back and they would say, you know, I'd say they want feedback. Sorry, you're not cleared for the information you gave us. <laughs> and the simple act of SAP, uh, Special Access Project, SAP, um, and classification, you know, once it went from our SAP, our Special Access Project, out to the larger intelligence community, probably most of the time, we weren't cleared for what happened afterwards. And so, um, you know, it was just, it would be against the law to give us feedback. Yeah. 
And then sometimes I think whenever you did get feedback, it was like a lot of time had passed in between like six months to seven months or eight months. And then it's just like, Oh, I already forgot about uh, you probably that, that remote viewing that I did six or seven months ago, but thanks for letting me know. (laughs) Uh, One time Dave did a, a session for them and found a tunnel, drew the tunnel, drew a very accurate picture of the tunnel found the tunnel exactly where it was and turned that in. And it was like the following week, uh, they came back with the information. I had done uh, uh, work. um, I did the session uh, predicting the meltdown of Chernobyl. And the following week, I got the feedback. Also the attack on, Oh, that was a really crazy one. (laughs) What was his name? Which attack? Where was it at? Oh, they attacked his home. Uh, He was harboring, uh, I don't know, I'll I'll think of the name. There were so many of them. Well, I know that the the Chernobyl one, right, they, you, you, thought that it was going to be a, a certain day and you told them that it was going to be a certain day, but then it turned out being a couple of days later, what was it a week later? And then they just threw out the information and said no. that it wasn't accurate. Was that how it went? No. The, the thing was uh, we had to follow our tasking. Okay. And the tasking for that was what will be the headlines on the Sunday paper. Mm. And uh, Chernobyl happened. But then Chernobyl, uh, the Russians didn't say anything about it. It was only when the uh, radiation fallout happened on Iceland that Iceland reported it. And so it was the following week mm-hmm. that Russia admitted that it had happened. Well, the task was what will be in the Sunday paper. So I had correctly predicted Chernobyl, everything about it, but that wasn't the task. Uh, In the training, one time uh, they had a historic house there in Maryland and uh, they gave me that as uh, as a target, a practice target. Now they never tell you what the target is. They just say, this is project Number 29045, describe it. That's all you get. So you have to be psychic to do it. And uh, I got this huge diamond and beautiful diamond and all that. And so they told me, sorry, you got it wrong. I took my session and we all went out to this historic house walked up onto the porch, and here was this crystal doorknob. I had viewed that crystal doorknob. My drawing was the right size and had the exact number of facets that were on that crystal doorknob. And I said, I got it. I got it. And uh, Skip said, uh, our, our director there said, Yeah, that was tremendous viewing, but the target was the house. You get a zero. And, you know, I I, I felt really hurt by the whole thing because I had done so well. And he said, no, when soldiers' lives depend on it, you do what you're tasked to do. And that was it. And the tasking on Chernobyl was what will be in the Sunday paper. Chernobyl did not hit the newspapers until the following week. Mm. And so so it did what, happen, but it just it wasn't reported until later on. Yeah. I didn't do the tasking. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. Wow. What did, did anybody else get the the Chernobyl or it was just you? Yeah. Right? No, just, just you. Oh, yeah. So that one. yeah. yeah. Uh, but um Several of the others got what would be in the Sunday paper. 
but, uh, but I, I agree with them. You know, if a soldier's life depends on do, you doing the tasking, you do the tasking. Absolutely. And it's a, uh, there is a lot of self-discipline that is required to be a military remote viewer. Tremendous amount of it. Yeah. Yeah. Now there's a few different ways that I, well, not ways, but two few different categories of uh, remote viewing uh, that I've found out. And that's the, the, the target remote viewing, which is the, what the, the military uh, has trained, you know, people to remote view is with a target, with a coordinates remote viewing, right? CRV is what it's called. Coordinates. Remote viewing. Right. Uh-huh. Now, do you absolutely need a target to remote view Lynn? Cause I hear this all the time. I hear, ah, oh, you have to have a target. You got to have uh, the coordinates to remote view, which I you'll don't hear, know. You'll hear people on, you know, uh, on the internet and all that say, oh, I don't need a target to view. And they get, oh, there's a, there's an airplane crash. And so they wait. And sure enough, there's an airplane crash. And they say, I got it. I got it. You know, I'm sorry, but every month there's an airplane crash somewhere in the world. Uh, and, and, you know, they'll say, oh, I see a crowd of people. And they look in the paper and scour the paper and all that and watch the news. And they see a crowd of people. Oh, I got it. Um, I'm sorry. That's, that's not it, you know. Um, but yeah, you can, you can view without a target. But how do you know what you're viewing? Uh, I mean, if you, if you say there's an airplane crash, and the numbers on the airplane are, then I'll put faith in what you did. <laughs> you know. That makes sense. Maybe I didn't word it in the right way. Do you, like, yeah, you have to have a target, but do you have to have the coordinates of the target? Oh, no, not really. Uh, the coordinates that are given... Ingo Swan started training by giving the geographic coordinates of each of the targets, practice targets that he was using for training. And uh, uh, when it came over into the military, we would get something like a missing soldier. Well, we didn't have geographic coordinates. If we did, we wouldn't need remote viewers to find them, you know. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so they started saying, well, we're not going to tell the viewer that we don't have the geographic coordinates because that would be basically telling the viewer, you know, what we're looking for and all that. And so they just started making up numbers. And it worked. Um so when they found out that it worked, they tried numbers and letters, and it worked. They tried uh, just getting a random number generator and poking it in and seeing what numbers came up, and they would give that as the target. Basically, what the coordinates do is they document what the session is about, because somewhere in there, there's going to be a report that says this was target number such and such. And uh, like uh, uh, one of the things I do with my students is uh, I give them the date to do the session. And I give them one for the day. It would be uh, 22 one 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 four today's the 14th yeah and that's the date they're going to do the session they'll write those numbers down and they'll get the target so it's not actually the coordinates has really nothing to do with the actual target then right that's right it has nothing to do with the target it gets the viewer started 
And there's a thing that follows the target numbers called an ideogram. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so that number specifies that session and on that target. And they're writing these numbers and then the ideogram happens because their pen is already moving. <laughs> the ideogram is very hard to do from a dead stop. So you have them write numbers, the pen's already moving and the ideogram happens. And uh, those are the two real purposes for the coordinates. That's really interesting. Um... I didn't. Uh, I thought. See, I thought maybe that the the coordinates had something to do with the actual target, but that makes way more sense uh, now that you've explained it, and now I can wrap my head around that it's just a part of the process and documents the actual session. It doesn't have anything to do with the actual target. And you know, with the military uh, getting targets every day, Ingo Swan's method of giving geographic coordinates. Pretty soon you learn where the oceans are, you learn where Europe is, you learn where Asia is, you learn if it's a negative number, you know, south, you realize where it is in the south and all that, uh, just by the number. And so actually giving the geographic coordinate wound up being pollution. Because you would think, oh, this is European target, oh. I'll bet this is, and you would pollute yourself. Yeah, the, the coordinates remote viewing makes so much more sense now. Like, I didn't really understand that. Thank you for explaining that. I, I hope people yeah. really, really listen to that because the way that I thought that it worked, I thought that the, the actual coordinates had something to do with the target. And then that didn't make any sense to me either because I'm like, well, then if you need to have the coordinates, then how would you remote view the past or the future, right? And let's say you wanted to remote view the the moon or remote view Mars or something like that's outside uh, of the planet when there isn't any coordinates for any of those places, you know? So uh, thank you for explaining that. That makes a lot more sense. Yeah. And then there's uh, a different, another kind of technique of remote viewing that I've uh, discovered too, that um, it's one that I ran across, it's called, uh, Shoot, what is it called? Um, associative, uh, associative remote viewing. ARV, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where you can essentially pick two different outcomes, look into the future to see which outcome you feel, uh, taste, or, yeah. or hear, and then, you know, base that off of your decision. Can you talk about uh, that a little bit? Uh, actually, most people who are t teaching ARV use two targets, and... Uh, you're supposed to um, view a target which will be associated with the outcome of a future event. ARV is for predicting future events. And uh, you're not limited to two targets. Um, for example, let's say that uh, I want to know what digit is going to be on the first ball of the pick three lottery. Okay. Let's say I look in the database and I find out that you as a viewer are really good at tastes. Anytime you describe smells, you, you know, but whenever it's a taste, man, you are dead on it all the time. Fine. Then I will say to you, uh, tonight at 10 o'clock, I'm going to give you a taste. Tell me what it is. And you sit down and you do your viewing and you say, mm, it's peanut butter. Okay. Unknown to you. Before I do that, I have set up a little chart of my own and not shown it to you. If a zero is on the ball, there's going to be, I'm going to give you salt. If there's a one on the ball, I'm going to give you vinegar. If there's a, two on the ball, on the ball, I'm going to give you some sugar. If there's a four on the ball, I'm going to give you some peanut butter. If there's a five on the ball and so on up through nine. Okay. When you tell me I'm going to taste peanut butter, I know what number is going to be on the ball. Because if there's 
a four on the ball. That's the only way I will give you some peanut butter. And so when you tell me peanut butter, I know there's going to be a ball, a four on the first ball. That would be really difficult to do with uh, the lottery, though. That <laughs> How many numbers you would have to assign to different uh, tastes and different well, flavors? You would get, you lose track. Is, you can get viewers together and uh, each one take a digit on a separate ball. Do you think you that, that do you think that that's been done before? <laughs> like to win the lottery? It's been done. Yeah. Uh -huh. And they got it right. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Wow. We, have, we have an analogy about a gold ring. If you find a gold ring in your yard, you're going to tell all your neighbors and tell everybody and all that. You dig a little deeper and you find a pot of gold, you're not telling anybody. Right. And so when, yeah, when these happen, you're not going to hear about it. Wow. So ex <laughs> explain how you would do it if you had multiple people again. Like, would you have them doing a, se a separate set of numbers and then another person doing another set of numbers and then so on and so uh -huh. on and you put them together? Let's say you have, um, let's go the simple way, 12 people. One does the first digit on the first ball. Another one does the second digit on the first ball. Another one does the first digit on the second ball. Another one does the second digit on the second ball. Okay. You win the lottery, you split it, split it 12 ways. You still make money. Wow. <laughs> okay. <That's> or genius. <laughs> have one viewer do 12 sessions. Okay. 12 separate sessions. Oh, uh, one time, well, I was raised in the Hard Shell Baptist Church, okay? And, uh, you know, you dance with that girl, you're going to hell. You gamble, you're going to hell and all that, you know? Yeah. And uh, I have pretty much outgrown that. But inside, in the subconscious, there's still that little boy in, in church afraid to go to hell, you know? <laughs> And uh, one time I sat across from a roulette wheel and picked black, red, or green and predicted the color it was going to fall into 22 times in a row without a mistake. I got tempted. I went over to the table, bet $10 and lost it. <laughs> <laughs> and inside that little that little Baptist boy inside was saying, I ain't going to hell for ten dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, That's amazing you got it right that many times and then when you went up to actually bet you you got it wrong. But that oh, probably exactly. saved you. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> you know so oh. Uh, one time I was at the Defense Intelligence Agency and there was nothing to do all day. There was a $40 million jackpot on the DC lottery. So I sat for, there for eight hours doing sessions, came up with the numbers for the DC lottery. On the way home, I bought a ticket and the next morning I read in the paper, I had gotten all the numbers correct, absolutely correct. But I had bought a Maryland lottery ticket. Uh, <laughs> 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 you know, uh, it just <laughs> got, got you twice. Gambling isn't no, for you, Lynn. <laughs> I don't gamble. No, I don't gamble. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. Two times in a row. Uh, Something's trying to tell you something, not the not the gamble. That's not your mission. Oh, I use the uh, the lottery for practice. I just don't gamble. 
How many times have you gotten it right? Oh, a lot of times. Yeah. Um, a lot of times you get one number off, but a lot of times, yeah. I just don't gamble. It's just for me, feedback that I'm doing well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like a practice, practice session, keep you sharp. That's right. Yeah. So there's another kind of remote viewing that I've uh, really been researching too. And this one is ERB. It's remote persuasion, right? Oh, remote, 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 influence. remote influencing that you can actually remote influence. Persuasion. Yeah, remote persuasion is what it should be called. It's called remote influencing, yeah. But it should be remote persuasion, yeah. Now, this this can be done, right? You can re remotely persuade someone to do something with these types of abilities, correct? Yeah, and we use it a lot for medical applications, uh, such as a, um, uh, let's say, a runner uh, breaks, breaks in, is in a car wreck and, you know, his knees get messed up and all that. And he just wants to give up. We can persuade him, hey, pick it up, try it, start running again, start doing things again, get him back to life, rather than just having him be despondent the rest of his life. We can help people um, um, cure themselves, you know, when when that's possible. Uh, we've had great success with uh, finding people who are in comas and helping them come out of a coma. Yeah. So uh, it's been very useful, the remote persuasion. Now, a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to make somebody kill themselves or hurt themselves or something like that, or I'm going to get even with somebody. It doesn't work. Yeah. So how would the remote persuasion work? Would you uh, continuously, would you remote view the person or the situation or the your target and then repeatedly say something or is it, uh, would that be the way that you would do it? Yeah, repeatedly. Yeah. This is why it's called persuasion because you can persuade them to do something and the next day they talk themselves out of it. So you have to keep persuading and persuading. Uh, this is different from what people think remote influencing is. They think it's remote control where I can make you do something. And uh, that's also possible, but I don't teach it. And I know of anyone who does. That's a, that's a gun you should never hand to a child, you know, <laughs> and. Uh, Absolutely. And then that makes me think of like, you know, how, how far can these abilities go? Like, I know that you just said that, you know, you don't teach it and you don't do it, but just for the, the, the show here and for the audience, could you affect someone physically with remote viewing? Could you like remote view and, and make them sick or, or cause them problems or even so far as to, remotely assassinate them or remotely kill them is that, that possible be, that would be the remote control and uh i find that absolutely despicable uh the remote influencing uh if it's to help someone yeah i'm for that if it's to hurt someone that's to me just almost as despicable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The only reason that I really uh, bring it up is because I, I believe that you, you were approached by some in, of the intelligence community, uh, maybe a men in black or somebody like that, that um, approached you and asked you to see if you could kill a individual. Gorbachev, yeah. Uh, and you said no, of course. But um, I said no. Yeah, yeah, you said no. And uh, yeah, I I was over at the golf course there on base, and uh, having lunch, 
And uh, these two came in and sat down and I, I can spot the men in black, you know, or, or I can spot that. Uh, had quite a bit of experience there. But uh, I got, I just quit eating. I got up to leave. They followed me out, told me to get in their car. And I did. And they drove around base, drove me around base and told me what they wanted. And I said, no. And so absolutely not. And so they took me back to the golf course. I got out of the car to get back into my car and just sort of out of meanness. <laughs> uh, I turned back around before I closed the car door and I said, but I can try to make him give up communism, slammed the door and walked off, mm. you know, and, uh, and so over the next couple of weeks, that kind of, I wonder if I really could. And uh, I didn't know that Gorbachev, uh, that Gorbachev was planning to end communism anyway. Mm. And so just to see if I could, I started doing the remote influencing. And uh, when, when he uh, gave his speech to end the communism, the words he used in that speech were the words I had been putting in. Mm -hmm. Now, I did not cause him to end communism. I didn't persuade him to. He was already planning to do it. What I think I did was I just gave him some words to use. And that was it. But the feedback I got, I was probably more surprised than anyone else because uh, I listened to his speech. I speak Russian. I listened to his speech. And uh, there it was, everything I had been repeating, word for word. Yeah. That's incredible. And I'm, ju I'm just curious here in asking this question, and you can uh, you can say yes or no, or, you know, you don't have to really get into it. But could you have killed him? If you actually tried, could you have uh, murdered him psychically if you really wanted to? I know how to do it. Could I do it? No, I couldn't bring myself to do that. No, I could not do it. Uh, um, it's like, you know, the men who stare at goats is like killing the goat. Uh, mm. I didn't kill the goat. <sighs> they said, Len... Lynn did it in the movie, but um, it was Lynn Cassidy. They had to do it, but um, I didn't kill the goat. I killed the computers, but uh, no, I I can never bring myself to do that. No. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, yeah, it wasn't so much like me asking you if you could. It was just like accessing the extent of your abilities and your powers. Like, would you Is be able to do it? Not if you would. I know that you wouldn't do it. You're a good person, obviously. You're a very fine gentleman. You would never do anything like that. But you're asking if it's possible. Yes. It's possible. Thank you. I appreciate that. Do you know who did explode the goat, though? Was he a part of the I unit? Explode the goat. Just kill the goat. Yeah. Kill the goat. Yeah, I killed the goat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was uh, someone in the 1st Earth Battalion who was uh, trained to do the work and uh, wasn't in our unit. It was in the 1st Earth Battalion, yeah. But the, um, yeah, the effect it had on him when he did it, uh, he never really got over that. Yeah, I was going to say it probably would be some kind of you know, blow back on you mentally or something like, or you would have to protect yourself or shield yourself. If you were uh, attempting to do something like that, you would have to have some kind of shielding. This right? Yeah. This is the thing with the remote influencing. What goes around does come around. You do it through the collective consciousness. 
and you're a part of the collective consciousness. You go hurting people, you're going to hurt yourself. You help people, you're going to benefit by it. You're going to help yourself. Yeah, I agree. It's kind of like a, a, a blowback type of thing. What you what you put into it is what you get out of it. Yeah. Like but they that, say, what that comes around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So were there... Uh, were there ever any, I know it's completely against military policy to bring uh, kids and involve them in any of these uh, military uh, classified projects, but were any kids ever involved or brought into any of the projects that you're aware of, Lynn, like whether it be uh, DIA or Army Intelligence or anything? Not in the U.S., no, uh I'm just curious because, you know, knowing ch children are more, uh, much more susceptible to these kinds of abilities. And, you know, uh, the Chinese in their, and the Chinese in their unit uh, would never use anybody who's older than 12 years old. That's really interesting. I mean, it would be really easy to, you know, develop their abilities under the right conditions, right? They, they yeah. could essentially be super remote viewers and spies fantastic ones <laughs> very yeah so um i think i mentioned remote remote viewing the past and the future earlier have you remote viewed the the future at all like far ahead in the future to try and see how certain events might turn out politically or uh, worldwide or if there's any kind of natural disasters or anything because a lot of people in this uh, community are you know always talking about a uh, big natural disaster coming and the you know people are preparing for it they're going underground and stuff like that have you removed viewed anything in the future that um, like that at all oh yeah uh, back in 1998. I was tasked to uh, remote view the future of the U.S. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the session said that starting in the year 2020, uh, there would be a series of man-made natural disasters that actually uh, uh, started in 2000 leading up to it. And, but in the year 2020, a series of man-made natural disasters would start happening, uh, uh, which would cause uh, the first man-made natural disaster that would happen would cause people to separate, keep social distancing. Uh, um, it would tend to close schools down, close uh, stores down and everything else. Uh, then that would be followed by, you know, a uh, situation where uh, the economy, uh, the uh, supply chain would just sort of dwindle. And it, it went on. But um, the um, finding wound up that by the year 2040, around 75% of the U.S. population would have been killed off. And about only 25% remaining. Now, I'm hoping to be wrong. Uh, there's, there's one thing about predicting the future. It's like the weatherman predicts the future as it is today. Tomorrow he does updates, the next day he does another update, the next day he does another update, because the future changes, especially if you act on the prediction. We have another analogy called uh, uh, the arrest at Joe's Bar and Grill. The police <clears throat> uh, task a remote viewer to say uh, where the criminal will be at 9 o'clock tonight. The remote viewer says he's going to be at Joe's Bar and Grill eating dinner. So at 8.30, 
they act on it. They go out and hide in the bushes. At 8.35, the criminal walks up to Joe's Bar and Grill. They jump out, arrest him, and at 9 o'clock, he's in jail. Mm -hmm. And so the remote viewing was wrong. He's not At 9 o'clock, he's not sitting there eating dinner. Now, if the remote viewer had said at 9 o'clock he will be in jail, they would never have gone out to Joe's Bar and Grill, and he'd be sitting there eating dinner. You know? mm -hmm. And so uh, there are many times when, uh, act, most of the times, when acting on a prediction will change the future. And uh, uh, right after 9-11, I was tasked to uh, predict the next attack. Uh, I did, and they stopped it. And uh, so one of the agents said, you know, we just made you wrong. I said, well, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm glad to be wrong. You, know? you stopped this. You stopped another attack on the United States? I didn't. They did, but you saw it. You predicted it. Was it in the United States that it was going to happen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it was uh, it was it was a minor little thing, just sort of to rub our nose in it. But uh, it was a very minor little thing. But uh, they were there waiting. And there have been a lot of times when I will predict uh, drugs coming across the border for for agents, you know. And uh, they go to where the drugs are coming across. The drugs come across the border and they catch them. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, so yeah. But, you know, on that one, they stopped the attack. I told what would happen when the attack happened. They stopped the attack and so it never happened. So I was wrong. Yeah. They're just playing games. That's uh, the the discrediting part of uh, of the whole well, phenomenon. Well, not actually. Not actually. It's the thing about uh, it lets you know that when a remote viewer predicts a future event, it is as the event stands at that moment. Then things can make it change, especially if you act on that prediction. It will change the future. The future is very changeable. The future is not written in stone. So 2040 was the, did you go past 2040 or was like 2040 the no, stopping mark? I passed 2040 and I found that the remnant, you know, the remainder of the people uh, cleaned out the government. They cleaned out uh, their lives, they cleaned up, you know, everything went back to self-sufficiency, uh, good government, honest government, honest politicians and all that. And life became exceedingly good. Uh, you know, uh, that it just brought about a whole new golden era. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, that's what I think is very plausible to happen. Uh, that, you know, unfortunately that's kind of just the way that it, that it has to go. Things have gone too far and they kind of have to collapse. They have to come down and there's no other way around it. We can't make any big changes with the kind of ways that we've been doing things on a large scale. So it's very highly plausible that, um, that that is very accurate. So, okay. So, so if you're remote viewing the the future, is it possible to change something while you're remote viewing it and seeing it in the future? Is it, or is it only the actions that we possibly put into effect in the the 3D uh, physical world that would change the future? Or can you actually go in? And it kind of goes to the influencing. Uh, of events that I was asking you about earlier or influencing a certain individual. It, is it possible to go in and influence future events or influence the future at all? 
It is, and uh, we've done some studies on this that tend to show that you cannot remote view something without in some small way influencing it. However, the influence on it is always extremely small. Yeah. Yeah. So you'd only be able to change this little small, uh, little minute. Very tiny, very tiny, usually not even noticeable. This is why in remote persuasion, you have to do session after session after session after session. Sometimes uh, I know one medical task I was given, I did over 300 sessions, but a, it was a woman who had been in a, uh, in a car wreck. She was uh, crippled from the waist down and had been in a wheelchair for eight years. And uh, they asked me, could you get her walking again? I said, no, you know, but I can try. I can see what happens. And uh, within within another two years, she was up and walking. And uh, and it was the remote persuasion uh, that helped her get everything back together. She healed, basically healed herself. Is it possible to manipulate objects or because um, you said in the beginning that you were able to uh, you had some sort of I forget what you called it but it was like a telekinesis power that you exploded uh, the computers you shut down all the computers you might not have exploded them but you shut them all down is yeah. it is it possible is that separate from remote viewing is that's a different kind of a, a ability right that would almost be like telekinesis powers where you can manipulate it's things called, in the physical so, reality yeah it's called psychokinesis uh, pk yeah and yeah it's very possible have you ever heard of the um uh, uh poltergeist kids yes okay uh, they get angry or something like that, or they get emotionally upset and things fall off shelves and all that. Yeah. And this is a proven thing. And uh, there are probably thousands more than you ever hear of. This is a normal thing that kids go through. And uh, they go through this period of it. Uh, I went through this period of it and was very strong in it. And I decided to play with it and uh, see what I could do to develop it. And it turned out being developed. Uh, um, and then I got angry. Some bad things happened and I decided I'll never do this again. But through life, if I get flaming angry, bad things happen. And... Uh, this is what happened with the computers there in Augsburg. Um, so, yeah. Um, do you think yeah, PK, really do you think PK, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but do you think PK uh, somehow helped you uh, having that ability before you started remote viewing in the unit? Do you think that that might have helped you in some sort of a way to develop your psychic powers more and make you uh maybe even more accurate than you would have been if you didn't have this PK ability? Yeah, I think so. Uh, anytime you develop any one of the psychic methods, it automatically strengthens the other methods too. <clears throat> um, I know uh, the students who teach CRV, they always come back and they say, hey, you wouldn't believe I wouldn't do in a session but I knew that a car was coming around the bend or I knew somebody was going to phone and they did immediately. I had even reached for the phone before the phone rang and things like that, you know. And so these, uh, anytime you develop your subconscious mind's ability to communicate with your conscious mind, your subconscious is psychic. Your conscious mind isn't. And uh, your conscious mind knows things. Here's another thing about CRV. 
with seeing our V, I can tell past, you know, I can find out information about past, future, present, anywhere in space and time, because my subconscious mind is able to do that. Everyone's is. Uh, it also knows why you do the things you don't want to do, but you wind up doing them anyway. Why you don't do the things you want to do, but they never get done. It knows all of your, you know, your freaky things inside of you and everything else. And, uh, and yeah, and those things become available to you on a conscious basis. Uh, so, yeah, developing any one of these psychic abilities will tend to develop the others as well. A sensitivity, sensitivity, simply because they teach your subconscious mind how to tell you things. So you'd have to kind of train your subconscious mind to be on almost the same level as your conscious mind, right? Where your subconscious kind of bleeds into your conscious mind or, you're, or are you just straight tapping in to your subconscious and then you can leave your subconscious? Yeah, no. Your subconscious is already far, way far beyond your conscious mind. <laughs> uh, they've done the studies to prove that, you know, before you get a conscious thought, it's it's already done in your subconscious mind. But, um, but yeah, no, the... Controlled remote viewing is not in itself psychics. Uh, what Ingo Swan invented was a an interview and report process where you consciously interview your subconscious mind, ask it a question, and get the answer. And what happens is, uh, through the use of physical training, the CRV sets up a line of communications. Uh, when you first start a remote viewing, a controlled remote viewing session, you're doing those coordinates and you're writing it down. You have trained for months and months that anytime there's water at the site, your hand will make waves. Anytime there's land, your hand will maybe make a straight line or a mountain or something like that. Anytime there's space or biological, you'll get a certain movement. It's training for CRV is much like training for any other martial art. Wax on, wipe off, wax on, wipe off. Mm -hmm. And you go through these ideogram drills where you teach a physical response to an inside awareness. Once you're doing these ideogram drills, and the, the monitor is calling out to you, land, water, space, all things like that. They watch for the time happens when you start doing the correct ideogram before they call it. Mm. And that's mm. when you go into the st second stage of training. And on the second stage of training, they have a picture in an envelope. And they say, this is your third target for the day. Describe it. And you say, well, I don't know what it is. How can I describe it? So they say, okay, write down this number. Uh, today's date and the number two. Okay, your second target. So you write this down and then your hand goes like this. And you say, I don't know what the target is, but I know there's some water and something manufactured some man-made thing that's all i know they open the envelope and here's a ship sitting on the ocean and by training this way you know uh you get your subconscious telling you the basics of the target when you go into stage two of training you say okay haven't shown you the target yet, okay? You say, okay, tell me about the water. How does it taste? Ooh, salty. You're getting a physical response. Uh, what's the temperature? Ooh, it's cold. You're getting a physical response. What color is it? 
uh, it's, it's sort of blue and it smells fishy, man, you know, and, you know, and you're getting these physical responses that describe the water. Okay, now describe the man-made thing. Oh, it, uh, if I bang on it, it, it's metallic and it's hollow. And I, and I hear the sounds of people laughing, you know, and it winds up being a cruise ship, you know. And, uh, and so you get these physical responses to what your subconscious is trying to tell you. And in the process, you wind up describing the target. So it's like a process. They start out oh, yeah. with the, the, the ideogram and then they move it to uh, tasting and, and feeling and, and, and then it kind of goes on from there. That's and so the, the like right now, step. if you were to remove you something and someone gave you a target, you wouldn't need an ideogram or anything. You you would just oh, I would. you wouldn't you still use it? Yeah, absolutely. yeah. Okay. because that ideogram says there's land and water. OK. okay. Oh, describe the land next describe the water in describing the land i hear the sound of children playing okay oh describe the children describe the play and so what happens is that first ideogram provides the structure for everything that follows and then when you write your summary you say, uh, I still don't know what the target is, but I know there's land and water, and the water is cold and salty. The land has children sounds on it, and they're playing, and here's what they're playing, and you describe it. And so from that first ideogram, you get the entire structure for your entire session and for your summary. So do you do you keep doing the ideogram after you're uh, describing the things from the first ideogram? Is there multiple ideograms in one session or is there just that that's like the base thing that you reference and then- you That don't... starts out the base thing. However, uh, during the session, you may get something, you'll be drawing a map, okay, of, of the location. And you'll draw a square thing, okay? And all of a sudden, there's an ideogram of water, okay? And so you know that at that point on the map, there's some water for some reason, okay? Later in the session, your monitor can say, go back to point number 10 and describe the water. Oh, it's blue. It's deep on one end and shallow on the other end, and it's in a square thing. And, you know, and all of a sudden there are lines on the bottom, and it's, you know, and all of a sudden you know that you're describing a swimming pool. But, uh, but by, by taking each fact that you find and using it as a cue, it gives structure to your session. This is why it's called controlled remote viewing. The remote viewing is under your control, okay? Most psychics just, oh, let it happen, you know? <laughs> and they're at the mercy of their subconscious, which, which has no logic. Their inner child, you know, just babbles. But by learning the controlled remote viewing, you have an interview and report process where you can specify, tell me more about this. Tell me more about this. Now, you said that was this. Tell me more about that. Okay. And uh, and you come up with a highly structured session with the details falling into the right place and all that. You're not at the subconscious mind's chaotic mercy. And this is the whole thing that Inga Swan invented. And uh, yeah, I was getting ready to say he start, he created those protocols uh, for the control oh, yeah. remover. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Ingo was a genius, absolute genius. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's really, that's really incredible. Thanks for breaking that down because I wanted to ask you earlier about the ideogram and uh, because I wasn't absolutely sure on how it worked. Yeah. So uh, thank you. Thank you for explaining that. And also thank you for explaining the, the co coordinate remote viewing. Uh, we could probably talk <laughs> all day here, probably talk for hours. I could probably come up with so many different more questions to, um, to ask you, but uh can you let people know? Uh, I'd love to have you back on sometime for sure. If you'd be willing to, uh, we can go even deeper on all kinds of stuff and talk about, you know, uh, other places that you've removed you because I believe that you've uh, removed you some off planet things too, like the moon and Mars and, and different planets like that. I'd love to bring you back on yeah. and talk about that as well sometime. Okay. In the all right. Uh, but could you let people know where they can uh, find you, find your uh, website or if they would like to oh. learn more about oh. remote viewing? Uh, my website is crviewer.com, crviewer.com. Uh, I also have started a um, GoFundMe, so if I can plug that. Yeah. Uh, it's Remote View Ranch. We're building it to be a training center for remote viewing of not just CRV, but all the different types of remote viewing and for doing research, to doing, you know, further research into remote viewing. Because, listen, we have learned by now that all of this stuff we're doing, we're in kindergarten. The human mind can do so much more. And so we're wanting to build this and... Uh, there's a site called Remote View Ranch. That's all one word, Remote View Ranch uh, dot com. And uh, if you go there, there's a video of the ranch and a GoFundMe thing. If somebody wants to help further this cause, listen, uh, Ingo always said if everyone learned remote viewing, you would know the truth. Bad politicians would be out of a job. Uh, criminals would be caught immediately, you know, and the world would be a better place. And I believe it. And so we're trying to start this remote view ranch to do training and research in the human mind. Uh, thank you so much, Lynn. I appreciate your time here this evening, and I highly recommend uh, highly recommend people check out uh, his website and uh, donate to uh, his ranch so we can get this up and running. He's probably the most proficient uh, remote viewer uh, slash psychic. Uh, I think they're kind of different, a little bit different in there, but um, probably uh, on the planet right now. So uh, go over there and check out his work. The link is in the description, both links to his website and his GoFundMe uh, for everyone else. Thanks for watching and listening. Much love to everyone in the chat. Please be sure to hit the thumbs up button to help the channel out in the YouTube algorithm. Share, subscribe, and hit the bell icon as well for notifications. And remember, we're not only in a spiritual war, but a war on humanity. Stay aware, stay alert, keep loving your heart for everyone. Stay safe out there. And if you can see through the illusion, you are the solution. See you guys next time.